Welcome everyone to our quarterly virtual Copic event for Rocky Mountain Cancer Centers. I'm Dr. John Burke. I specialize in blood cancers. I will be moderating today's session along with four of my incredible partners, Dr. Michelle Levy from Denver, Dr. Chris Benton from Denver, Dr. Praveena Solapuram from Thornton, and Dr. Tony DeCarolis from Colorado Springs. From a previous survey, we heard that you guys wanted to get an update on hematology. So we have put together this virtual program on common hematology problems faced by primary care physicians and providers. We hope you'll find the program beneficial. Uh, the attendees will be mute, muted throughout the presentation. If you have any questions, please enter those using the chat feature. We will be monitoring the chat throughout the presentation and we'll get to your, as many of the questions as we can. Uh, we also have some knowledge-based questions for you attendees to answer during the session. Uh, your attendance will be reported to Copic, so thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, the five of us have worked together to come up with the topics that we thought would be of the most interest to you. And so the four topics that we came up with are anemia, malignant hematology, hypercoagulable workup, and when to refer patients with high white blood cell counts and abnormal serum protein electrophoresis. So to start uh, with our first topic, we have a polling question. So before I turn it over to Dr. Levy, uh, we have uh, uh, some questions to test your knowledge. Um, and the first polling question is here regarding anemia. So of the following options, what is the best test to assess a patient's total body iron stores? Answer choices are serum iron level, transferrin saturation, ferritin, uh, mean corpuscular volume, or MCV, or the hemoglobin. We're going to give you about five more seconds to get your votes in, and we'll close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so 62% uh, of you got the correct answer, which is ferritin. The ferritin is the best measure of the body's uh, iron stores. Um, and so now we'll turn to uh, uh, Dr. Levy here. So Michelle, when you're referred a patient for anemia, uh, what values in the CBC do you look at? So first off, off, I always look at the full CBC to assess for any other concurrent cytopenias. I think the most important thing to do is to make sure that there's not a concurrent leukopenia or thrombocytopenia. And if there is, we're dealing with something probably a little more serious. Um, the next thing I look at is the MCV because that gives us an indication of the size of the red blood cells. And secondly, I look at the total RBC because sometimes you can have an elevated red blood cell count and a low MCV. And that may be more indicative of something like a thalassemia rather than an iron deficiency. Um, so as part of the workup, what I'll do first is look at the MCV, the total red blood cell count, and um, ensure that there are no other concurrent cytopenias or abnormalities that may indicate that something more serious could be going on. And so when you see someone with anemia, what, what kind of a workup do you usually do? What tests do you order? So the first test that I like to order is a reticulocyte count because the reticulocyte count will give us an indication of if the bone marrow is having an appropriate response to the anemia. And if the reticulocyte count is elevated, that would indicate something more in the way of a hemolytic picture. Um, whereas if the um, reticulocyte count is low, that may indicate, that would indicate a hypoproliferation, which could be indicative of some type of nutritional deficiency, such as iron, B12, folic acid. Um, and so the best measures for that would be, I always like to do a uh, serum iron when a patient is fasting, because I find that it can be more accurate and more reproducible. Oftentimes patients will come to me when they're on an iron supplement and they may have taken that supplement the morning of their labs. And oftentimes their iron saturation may look normal or elevated, but truly it could be low. And that's when the ferritin comes into play because the ferritin in a patient who is iron deficient is usually low, although you have to be careful with the fact that a ferritin can also be an acute phase reactant. So sometimes that number can be 
um, normal or elevated, but the patient could still have an iron deficiency. Um, when I'm concerned about a um, folic acid or a B12 deficiency, I often will check a methylmalonic acid and a homocysteine level to ensure that I'm getting a true value and not missing an underlying deficiency. Um, with regard to hemolysis, it's important to check for a Coombs to see if that's a um, autoimmune hemolysis. And it's also important to check a haptoglobin. You would expect that to be low um, if the patient has an active hemolytic picture going on. Another thing that's really important is always check a peripheral smear because a peripheral smear can give us some indication as to other abnormalities going on in the blood cells. Um, and so things like um, schistocytes would indicate something more serious going on or sickle cells. Um, that those are things that you would often see on a peripheral smear, whereas you may not see if you just do a CBC. So when you get, when you receive, you know, see patients with anemia um, and, and they're referred by the primary doctor, do you, do you request from the doctor that they send certain things before they get to you? So what, what would your advice be to the primary physicians on the phone who are wondering, you know, what test should I be sending before they get to your office so that you kind of have a starting point? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a good idea to, um, if you see a low hemoglobin that's borderline low and there are no other concurrent cytopenias, it may be worthwhile to do a repeat check within a week or two. Um, otherwise, I think if there's, def if there's more than one cytopenia that you see on a CBC, you can send them directly over. Um, if it's simply anemia, and then I think it's reasonable to check a ferret, ferritin and an iron saturation. It's good to have a reticulocyte count. Um, but if you're more comfortable just sending them straight over so that we can do the workup, I'm happy to take it from there. Um, I think, you know, having a repeat check if it's just borderline low is, is definitely appropriate. Um, iron stores, the ferritin, um, if the... If you're worried about if the patient say is a vegetarian um, or they've had gastric bypass surgery, those are patients who may have other concurrent um, nutritional deficiencies. And so checking a B12 or a folate might be um, relevant in those patients. So oftentimes it, it's more than just the numbers that I'm looking at, it's more the clinical history as well. Yeah, um, and speaking of gastric bypass surgery, how do you decide when your patients need oral iron or IV iron and is that you know, is oral iron something you think primary care physicians can provide? And what's your advice to them on, you know, types of oral iron to give, dose, schedule, and when should the patients be referred to you for IV iron? Yeah, absolutely. I think in patients who have underlying um, gastric bypass, they won't absorb iron well. So I think that's definitely a time for IV iron. Um, if they have tried oral iron in the past and can't tolerate it based on GI upset or severe constipation, then that's a reason to send them over for um, IV iron. Generally speaking, um, I would prefer, I prefer patients if they're starting on iron um, to make sure that you check an iron um, saturation as well as a ferritin before starting, because I have seen sometimes where it can get complicated if the patient has a thalassemia, they may look like they're iron deficient with a very low MCV, but they may actually not have a true iron deficiency. So that would be an important time to make sure that you're um, not just starting iron on the basis of a low MCV. Um, in terms of supplementation, I think ferrous sulfate over the counter is a very reasonable option. Um, patients generally can tolerate that pretty well. I often will advise patients to take it just once a day um, and to take it with some type of vitamin C to help it be absorbed more um, easily. The other thing is that a lot of patients these days are on proton pump inhibitors or H2 blockers. And so the acid in their stomach will be lower. And so if you do have a patient who has issues and is on a PPI, I often will tell them to take the iron at the opposite time of day. So if they're taking their proton pump inhibitor in the morning, I'll have them take their iron in the evening with a little bit of juice because that way it'll be more absorbed. That's a good tip. I confess I forget that one myself. So that's good. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that one back like, to my clinic. I've been on iron for so long, it's not working. And then I say, hmm. And, it, and oftentimes they, they may be on a PPI. And so that can trip people up. Um, Perfect. Yeah. Good.
So. All right. Well, thank, thanks so much. Let's move on to our uh, second topic. Again, don't forget to uh, uh, put any questions you have in the chat. We'll come to those a bit later. Um, so we're going to start with a polling question here. Um, uh, so this is a question to test your knowledge. So in a patient with myelodysplastic syndrome and anemia, the mean corpuscular volume, or MCV, is classically, and here are your answer choices, low, MCV less than 80, normal, MCV between 80 and 100, slightly elevated, MCV 100 to 110, or markedly elevated, MCV 111 to 120. Okay, we'll close the poll in about five seconds. Oh, there, we'll just close it now. That's fine. And so uh, it looks like 40% of you, the, the winner is 40% says slightly elevated with an MCV of 100 to 110. So we'll have Dr. Benton tell us his preferred answer on this one. Chris, what's, what is the MCV in your MDS patients most commonly? I would say most commonly slightly elevated. I agree with uh, with that 40%. Yeah. Um, the... Um, the, the, the points, um, so, so certainly if you see a patient who has anemia with a slight macrocytosis, uh, you know, this is, um, this is a big clue for um, the possibility of myelodysplastic syndrome. This is especially true in patients that are, um, that are older, um, as MDS is really a disease of aging. Um, in patients who have more than one cytopenia, um, you know, a, as was mentioned before, that that is definitely a reason to send the patient to to see us. Um, but typically, um, the MCV is high, uh, is what I see. And yeah. so, um, you know, w while the MCV can be high in um, in other disorders because of a reticulocytosis. Um, I, I think the primary abnormality here is that the bone marrow is just not working correctly. Uh, that's kind of the way that I've always uh, interpreted this, that if you were to look at the architecture of the bone marrow, this is just an abnormal kind of production factory for the blood system. And so, um, and so it, it spits out red blood cells that are a little bit off. And, uh, you know, I see this MCV of 100 to 105 most frequently in patients, um, uh, you know, e even as high as 110 in patients who have MDS. Yeah. Um, the, um, yeah. Uh, I was gonna say, is there, is there a certain degree of uh, cytopenias that makes you more or less worried about uh, MDS or bone marrow disease? You mentioned, you know, having combinations of cytopenias being, you know, a red flag. Any, what about the degree of cytopenias? Um, most definitely, the the more severe the cytopenia, probably the um, you know more urgent the consult. Um, there's there's not really a, a particular degree. We're always happy to see patients and kind of assess for that. As Michelle said, um, you know, always feel free to send us patients if um, if if there's uncertainty. The um, <clears throat> but but uh, most definitely the the more severe the cytopenia is. Um, you know, this, this is probably a little more urgent. Um, you know, when I see, uh, uh, you know, he hemoglobin approaching 10, when I see platelets approaching 100, uh, when I see white blood cells that are less than three, these are, you know, kind of big red flags for me that a patient may need a bone marrow examination um, from the get-go. Um, you know, those aren't, those aren't hard and fast rules or hard and fast numbers, but those are certainly um, numbers that I, that I think about. Um, the reason for early uh, kind of referral to hematology is that, um, you know, the landscape for treatments in myelodysplastic syndrome and AML is changing. Uh, we have clinical trials. Um, we have recent evidence that earlier intervention may be better in some patients with uh, kind of intermediate, um, intermediate risk stratification. Um, there's new data that stem cell transplant uh, may benefit um, older, even older patients um, that, you know, the transplanters can use reduced intensity conditioning. Um, and so this is a more tolerable kind of uh, treatment for elderly patients. Um, and so um, certainly, um, you know, early referral is always always preferred so that, that we can evaluate these things, especially in the elderly patients. Um, one point I'll also make about the cytopenias and the, the degree and the number of cytopenias is to um, make sure to do a baseline evaluation for liver um, uh, liver dysfunction and also splenomegaly. These are things that can affect the counts and uh, is good to know sort of, um, you know, coming into an evaluation about a, 
uh, about a patient who may have MDS. And when you say evaluation for splenomegaly, do you do that with physical exam or do you also get an imaging study? How, wh what do you do for that? Yeah, so uh, definitely physical exam is probably the easiest, um, cheapest, and most effective way uh, to initially evaluate for, for splenomegaly. Um, uh, you know, in, in some patients where, where we feel an enlarged spleen or think that we can feel a spleen tip, then we will also additionally get imaging. Yeah. I confess I cheat sometimes if I, if I don't trust my physical exam and they're a little overweight, I'll, I'll not uncommonly get an ultrasound of the spleen just to make sure, because sometimes you can, be, you know, you can miss it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, most definitely. Obesity is a big uh, barrier to an accurate uh, spleen exam. Yeah. All right, second question for you, Dr. Benton. So if you, if you refer to a patient with, or if you see a patient with an, who gets an MRI that has an abnormal bone marrow signal, what what's your approach to that patient? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so uh, just just to wrap up uh, about MDS, you know, um, uh, always feel free to send us patients. We we have clinical trials that um, you know we think we have better treatments you know coming up for MDS, uh, which you know previously in high risk patients was more of a death sentence, but now we're looking at longer term outcomes. Um, and, and sort of staying on that same idea of, of bone marrow disorders, um, we, we certainly get this consult. Um, I, I get this consult probably one or maybe even two times per month, um, which is an MRI that shows an abnormal bone marrow signal. And oftentimes I've noticed the radiologist will go so far as to say, um, you know, a leukemic or lymphoma process needs to be ruled out. Um, and, and I think those, um, those cases when patients have an incidental finding like that on an MRI, it's good to see a hematologist. Um, I will say that an MRI is, a, is kind of a terrible way at look, of looking at the bone marrow. Um, and, it, you know, so far in my experience, um, you know, nine out of 10 of these, these cases is um, the, the abnormal signal is something else. So I always reassure patients that the MRI is a kind of a terrible way to look at the bone marrow. Um, and, you know, so far, I've, I've really only had about one case where an, a leukemia was picked up on, uh, on an MRI. And we evaluate for that with a peripheral uh, workup, peripheral blood workup. And then if needed, we can always get a bone marrow. And like I said, I've, I've seen one diagnosis uh, that came out of that. And so it's always, you know, that was a patient with chronic myeloid leukemia or CML. Um, but certainly that is uh, worth a consult. Um, and typically we do the workup uh, with the peripheral blood workup. Um, followed by a bone marrow if we need to, but oftentimes, you know, this is this is something that we just track over time and offer the patient reassurance. All right, so you're too vague. I'm going to pin you down. You refer to patient, okay. abnormal bone marrow signal, CBC and smear are stone cold normal. Are you going to do a bone marrow biopsy? No, I track the patient. Okay. <laughs> I, don't, I never know what to do there, so that, thank you for answering. <laughs> but for, I, I track the patient. I think the MRI is just a, is not a great, it's just not a good way of looking at the bone marrow. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, like I said, so far in, you know, 11 out of 12 cases, um, this has been, uh, this has been um, uh, just a, a nothing burger. Red herring. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. All right. Thanks. So we're going to move on to our third topic, which is hypercoagulability. So we've got a polling question for you guys. So the question is, in a patient with a single unprovoked venous thromboembolic event, which of the following risk factors requires lifelong full-dose anticoagulation therapy? Uh, choices are lupus anticoagulant or antiphospholipid syndrome, factor V Leiden mutation, prothrombin gene mutation, or methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase or MTHFR mutation. And we'll close in five, four, three, two, one. All right, so the factor V Leiden mutation is not one that actually um, uh, definitely requires lifelong anticoagulation therapy. So the correct answer here is the lupus anticoagulant or antiphospholipid syndrome, which always requires lifelong full dose anticoagulation therapy. So. Great. Uh, so, Dr. Soloporum, we'll, we'll turn to you. So, when uh, should primary doctors refer you patients for hypercoagulable workup? 
most of the times um, when somebody is young and has less than 45 years of age and has an unprovoked DVT, that would be one reason uh, for them to be referred to our clinic for consideration of hypercoagulable workup. And um, the other patient would be somebody with recurrent thrombosis uh, who, um, who's had more than one episode of thromboembolic events, whether it is a DVT or a PE. Uh, one other patient would be somebody with arterial thrombosis, thrombosis uh, in, in the arteries. And um, in the fourth uh, patient that would be a candidate for a testing of hypercoagulable panel would be thrombosis in an unusual location, like hepatic thrombosis, portal vein thrombosis, mesenteric cerebral vein thrombosis. And then, um, and also, uh, I am yet to see a patient with warfarin-induced skin necrosis, but that would be a patient who needs hypercoagulable workup uh, and potentially be checked for protein C, protein S, or antithrombin-3. And um, in anybody with thromboembolic events uh, who has a first-degree uh, relative with a documented venous thromboembolic event at age less than 45, that would also be a candidate for uh, testing for hypercoagulable panel. Got it. And when you see someone that you decide to do the test, what test do you order and not order? Yeah. So, you know, there are some cases wherein you do not need hypercoagulable workup, although you didn't ask me this question. But if somebody has a provoked uh, first episode of thromboembolic event or has active malignancy or has active inflammatory bowel disease or um, has heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and or a myeloproliferative disorder, those would be the patients who do not need a hypercoagulable workup because they have an explanation for their thromboembolic event. Um, and if you decide to do a hypercoagulable panel uh, and if you are suspecting an inherited thrombophilia, uh, the most common test that would be ordered would be the five inherited thrombophilia tests uh, for factor V Leiden, prothrombin gene mutation, protein C, protein S, and antithrombin 3. Those are the most five uh, commonly uh, ordered tests. Uh, and um, if somebody has a prolonged uh, PTT or has thromboembolic events that are recurrent or is very young, then you should check for uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And you check for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome with a lupus anticoagulant, anticardiolipin antibodies, beta-2 glycoprotein antibodies. And as you know, they should be checked uh, once and they should be rechecked in three months. So, and if somebody has thrombosis in an unusual location, hepatic vein, portal vein, mesenteric vein thrombosis, then they should be checked for a JAK2 mutation as well as a flow for PNH. What about timing of the and, hypercoagulable test? Is there a certain time you like to send them, uh, say like soon after the clot, or do you wait a period of months and then do you take them off of anticoagulation when you do the testing? You know, usually uh, we would want them to be off of anticoagulation for two weeks when we check them for uh, hi these hypercoagulable conditions because uh, there is various things that could be affected. If somebody has an acute event and their levels of antithrombin 3, protein C, protein S could be lowered by the acute event. And um, if you if somebody is on heparin, then their antithrombin 3 levels can be lowered. And sometimes heparin interferes with the detection of a lupus anticoagulant. And we all know that warfarin or coumadin um, can lower protein C and protein S levels. And even the newer anticoagulants, Xeralto, Eliquis, Pradaxa, they can also alter protein C, protein S, and antithrombin 3 levels. So it will be ideal uh, if they are checked for these conditions two weeks off of uh, anticoagulation. If somebody cannot is very high risk, they cannot be taken off of anticoagulation, and if they're being bridged with Lovenox for a procedure, then that could be the time where these conditions could be checked. But for antithrombin-3, because it's affected by Lovenox and heparin, that level should be ideally checked when patient is on warfarin or not an anticoagulation. <laughs> so it gets confusing. <laughs>
<laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, great. Um, well, thanks so much. Anything else to add or? Look like you, you know, I think one quick point here uh, to add is oftentimes uh, when somebody has recurrent thrombosis, uh, they're all often asking us, uh, when should you consider doing uh, workup for underlying malignancy? So, um, you know, um, and oftentimes we just do age appropriate, we just ask them uh, basic questions about any underlying cancer symptoms, do a history physical, and or oftentimes we are doing age appropriate cancer screening. Yeah. More intensive screening with tumor markers, CT scans, EGD, colonoscopy has not been shown to be very effective. So don't in terms pan of scan everyone. Decreasing huh? mortality. Yeah. Okay, Correct. fabulous. Thanks. Uh, all right, Thank let's you. move on to our fourth and final topic. Uh, turning to Dr. DeCarolis, the topic here is when to refer high white count and abnormal uh, serum protein electrophoresis patients. So we'll start with a knowledge question for everyone. So in a Mayo Clinic study, which of the following was the most common cause of polyclonal gammopathy, meaning elevated immunoglobulins with a serum immunofixation showing no monoclonality? Uh, answer choices are autoimmune disease, HIV infection, malignancy, and liver disease. All right, we'll give it another five seconds. Four, three, two, one, and we'll close the poll. And the winner in the voting is liver disease, and that is, in fact, the correct answer. So that's a tip that I, I didn't know a while back. So uh, that's a little tip is that when you see somebody with a polyclonal gammopathy, you want to make sure you check them for underlying hepatitis B and C because they could have underlying liver disease. Okay, so Dr. DeCarolis, as a medical oncologist, what ranges for a high white blood cell count should constitute a referral to you? All right, thanks, Tom. Um, well, I'm a little less able to range the number of white cells more than the kind, but so we're going to talk more about you know, sort of looking at your differential and figuring out what kind of white blood cells you are. I'll preface it by much as Dr. Levy. If, your CBC doesn't just show a high white count, but there's bad anemia, platelets all over the place. That, you know, that's a more serious problem. They need to truck over to your friendly hematologist and get you looked at. But if we're talking more about sort of isolated, moderate elevations of white count, what you really got to start with is knowing what kind of white cell these are. Are these neutrophils? Are these lymphocytes? Other things. And that really guides what you're going to do with the primary care in terms of workup or who needs to come over and see us. So you got to get a diff, or if they got a diff, you got to look at your differential, which is down there at the bottom of your CBC, your newts, your lymphs, your monos, and see what's elevated. And just as an aside, try to look at the absolute counts, the percentage there, they're, you know, yeah, they're there. But what you really want to know is the total numbers of these cells, and that's that absolute count. So you want to look at that first. And so just in kind of the interest of time, if we're talking about neutrophils being elevated, that is going to be virtually universally a reactive process to something else happening in the system. Inflammatory, obviously, classically, infectious disease issue. But the list is... You know, as long as my arm of things that can cause moderate elevations of neutrophils, anything inflammatory, connective tissue, even things, MIs, your PE, your gouts, your stones, your everything um, can cause moderate elevation of, of neutrophils. Particularly, uh, I think smoking is often overlooked um, as a common cause of chronic mild to moderate neutrophilia in adults. I mean, 20% of people still smoke, and there's uh, lots of those people running around with high white counts. Um, you know, the mechanism is probably inflammatory in the, in the bronchial tree, but nobody knows for sure. But there's plenty of studies that smokers have higher white counts than other people. So, uh, But if you're talking about neutrophils, um, you're talking about generally reactive process, you can follow them, track this, kind of do your workup, uh, piece it together. If we're getting to extreme levels, by all means, give us a call. We'll get involved. And um, but that's sort of the, the neutrophil side of things. On the flip side, if we're talking about lymphocytes 
being elevated, that's a little more uh, concerning. Most time elevations in the limbs are going to be some sort of clone, a clonal process, malignant process. If you're seeing a persistent elevation of the lymphocytes, that's probably somebody who needs to come over and see, and see one of us and get a workup. Do they have a little smoldering CLL, a lymphoma, something like that? So that probably deserves uh, a consult a little more than the neutrophil count. Um, so really the key here is what's driving the high white count and, and trying to kind of make some decisions based on that. Got it. All right. So take on point is look at the diff and look at the absolute counts and, and then direct your level of concern based on that. All right. And then next question for you, Tony, what do you, do you, what do you want to do with abnormal serum protein electrophoresis? Do you want to see all those patients? What should the workup be for those folks? Yeah, so, um, you know, kind of as your question implied, we're, we're talking about two processes. So we're getting lots of SPEP uh, patients come over and plenty of good reasons to get uh, protein electrophoresis. There's lots of good reasons you want to screen for myeloma or plasma cell diseases, your unexplained anemia, your bone issues, renal failure, all those sorts of things, high calcium. So it's a pretty inexpensive relatively good kind of screen for looking for a clone, but really what you're looking for here is, is this a monoclonal M-spike issue or the polyclonal that we talked about in the question? Um, because just kind of by definition, if this is a spike of a single kind of antibody, the implication there is pretty clear that's coming from a clone of cells one clone of cells making one kind of antibody creating this spike on your electrophoresis. So by definition, we're talking about a clone and that's getting down the malignancy road. And so we need all those people. Uh, they may have small spikes. We still ought to see them. We ought to kind of work them up, make sure this isn't uh, anything that we're pressing. The majority of these are going to be you know, smoldering issues, particularly in your geriatric population, five to eight percent of the geriatric patients who do SPEPs are going to get a, a hit on a small spike. Send them over. We'll, we'll kind of look it over make sure it's nothing, but you're going to find them. And you need to see them on the flip side, this polyclonal business of kind of a broad-based antibody response to something else is going to be reactive. And you know, we don't need to see all those people. We're happy to talk about them, but you're going to want to look for the liver disease is number one, but any of the connective tissues diseases, any of those things can do that. And, and that's probably heading down your work up more than, than ours, but call us at any point and we can walk through those sorts of things. Yeah, so bottom line, every patient with a monoclonal protein deserves to see a hematologist for, you know, determination of the evaluation. There is an underlying clone and we need to determine how serious that is. It may not mean they need treatment, but you need to figure out how serious it is. In fact, most of them do not need treatment. All right, so we've left some time for questions. I think we got about six or seven minutes. So I'm gonna to turn to the chat questions here. And uh, Dr. Levy, I'm gonna throw this one out to you. What is your opinion on slow FE uh, over the counter for iron replacement? And then how do you dose uh, the iron replacement therapy? Um, I think slow FE is a fine choice. I think there's there's some um, studies on hepcidin regulation and whether or not having the slow amount of iron sort of constantly there is actually going to downregulate your hepcidin and not have as good of a response to your um, oral iron. So in those cases, it may be um, it may be worth a trial. I, I definitely don't think it's a problem. Some people tolerate it well. They're, it's good for their GI tract. They don't have issues with it and they do have um, an appropriate response, although I have seen it go both ways. Um, in terms of dosing iron, it really depends on what the stores are, what you expect the losses to be. There is a calculation that you could in theory do. Um, I generally will do iron sucrose as that is very well tolerated. Um, and other times I will do um, ferrahim, which you can have fewer doses for that. Um, but it's, it's looking at the picture. If someone's having very heavy menstrual bleeding, then you may need to do 
more um, because they have continued losses. Whereas in other cases, it may be they lost a lot of blood and now they're feeling fine and they don't have continued losses. Okay, great. All right, Michelle, I have another question for you. So is there any benefit to measuring the soluble transferrin receptor or hepcidin level in iron deficiency? Do you do, you do those tests? I, I do not generally do those. Okay. I have a partner who sends a soluble transferrin receptor a lot, maybe a couple partners who do, and they use it to, you know, in, in cases of sort of questionable iron deficiency, the high uh, soluble transferrin receptor level is thought to maybe indicate uh, iron deficiency. I confess I don't use that too much, and I'm not sure I've ever sent a hepcidin level, so that's, that's my practice. But yeah, there's definitely differences of practice in that one, so that's a tough question. All right, uh, Dr. Benton, I have a question for you. What is your workup for polycythemia? Great question. So for polycythemia, we really want to look for the difference between a primary cause and a secondary cause. A primary cause being a bone marrow problem where the marrow is just producing red blood cells without abandon. And a secondary cause, which is where there's low oxygen tension, a physiologic response uh, that causes uh, higher uh, red blood cells. At a minimum, I check a CBC. Um, I check a CMP as a matter of practice. I check a smear review. I check a reticulocyte count. And I check an erythropoietin level, where the erythropoietin level can give us an idea of whether or not this is more likely to be physiologic, where you see an adequate um, or an, even an elevated erythropoietin versus if it's um, a primary uh, issue uh, where sometimes you see a very low erythropoietin. In other words, the body senses there's too many red blood cells and it shuts off the EPO. Um, and you know this could be indicative of, uh, for instance, a polycythemia vera, which is a myeloproliferative neoplasm. Um, I will also send a JAK2. Uh, in, in many cases, uh, JAK2 V617F is responsible for the vast, vast majority of polycythemia vera uh, MPN cases. And so uh, in, in some patients, I will also send that. It kind of uh, depends on the clinical situation um, and um, you know uh, whether or not we have another explanation for their polycythemia and erythrocytosis. Yeah. I, my, I guess my answer, I, I send it pretty much on everyone, the JAK2 mutation and EPO level, and I use it, to, you know, even in cases where I suspect secondary, I'll send both tests. Uh, it's usually pretty straightforward. Very low EPO, positive JAK2 mutation, that's polycythemia vera. And any other scenario is secondary polycythemia. So JAK2 negative and usually the EPO level is normal. So then you have an immediate distinction between primary polycythemia vera or secondary. And you can, you know, go down the secondary workup as much as you want. Um, Okay, great. And then uh, let me throw uh, Dr. DeCarolis, we have time for two more questions. Uh, uh, Dr. DeCarolis, do all patients with platelets in the 80 to 100 range need a heme evaluation if the rest of the CBC is normal? What's your approach to that degree of thrombocytopenia? Uh, no, um, I think uh, if everything else is normal, I, I guess uh, if they're implying from the question they don't have another explanation, I always uh, would go through the medication list in this country. We got lots of people on lots of drugs and, and so I would kind of scour their medication list first and foremost and make sure we're not doing it. Um, and then you know, other kind of medical things, uh, liver disease, things like that. Um, but if you're thinking, boy, I really think this patient's got I I just want to follow them, which I think kind of where we're heading with the question, then you know, I think it's not a bad idea to send them over, let, get another set of eyes on it if you're just going to follow it for, uh, for a while. I got no problem with that. Really nothing bad's going to happen to them at 80,000 platelets. If you want to track it for a while or, or just kind of call and see, you might want to make sure they don't have hepatitis, you know, you can the guidelines, hepatitis, you don't have identify, but yeah, you can follow them for a while, but um, by all means, we'd love to kind of talk about those patients and 
for a question it was kind of they send them over and we don't do anything so they're wondering why they're sending them over and that's yeah. a reasonable question my other quick tip that you know pcps can do before sending them over is is do a smear and or have a pathologist look at the smear and then run a CBC in a blue top tube or citrate tube to make sure there's no clumping. And that'll be, you know, you could, you could uh, eliminate a need for a referral if you find some clumping with those two tests. All right, Dr. Solaparam, one more quick question. Uh, co this is not an easy one, but you get, you get 60 seconds here. Uh, COVID-induced thrombosis. So uh, any comments on is there a best way to treat that? Is there a specific drug that's best? Uh, what's been your experience with COVID-induced thrombosis? Uh, as we know, um, COVID is a hypercoagulable condition. It increases the risk of thromboembolic events, especially if the patients are uh, admitted to the hospital, either on the regular floor or in the ICU. Um, but for COVID-induced thrombosis, um, if they're on the regular floor, they do not have any his they do not have any thromboembolic events. Then they are given prophylactic doses of Lovenox or heparin. And, uh, but if they have documented VTE or are in the ICU, um, we have often given them therapeutic doses of uh, anticoagulation, either with Lovenox, heparin, even the new newer anticoagulants, Eliquis, um, uh, Zeralto, they all have been used. Majority of the patients this side of the town are on Eliquis. Um, and even uh, they are on uh, anticoagulants for about three to six months post discharge from the hospital. Um, and oftentimes they also have some mild uh, decrease in platelet counts, uh, but uh, certainly their risk of thrombosis is much, much higher. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks everyone. I think we're going to uh, summarize here. So I'll just kind of run through a few take home uh, points for everyone to remember. So first in the evaluation of anemia, uh, the key tests for you guys to order are the retic count, a peripheral smear, and then looking for hemolysis, we do LDH and haptoglobin. If you think it's a hypoproliferative anemia, we do iron, TIBC, ferritin, B12, and folate. And if you think it's hemolytic, you can do a direct antiglobulin test. Uh, and when treating iron deficiency, use ferrous sulfate, uh, usually 325 milligrams. I recommend up to three times daily with meals, and you heard some additional tips from Dr. Levy. Uh, if, and one other comment, if, if the patient is a menstruating woman, you kind of know the source, but if it's not a menstruating woman, uh, then you need to remember to look for a GI source of blood loss. Turning to uh, myelodysplastic syndrome, think about myelodysplastic syndrome in an elderly patient with any uh, cytopenia, especially if they have an elevated MCV in the low 100s, and also if they have multiple cytopenias at the same time. Uh, and in those patients also, don't forget to look for liver disease and splenomegaly. Um, and then in, uh, Dr. Solopura made the point that uh, patients do not need to go und undergo a hypercoagulable panel uh, if they have a provoked event, meaning an event that occurs uh, after surgery or in the setting of cancer or in a, a major trauma or something like that. Those patients do not need uh, to undergo uh, thrombophilia testing. And uh, the final point, uh, all patients with uh, monoclonal gammopathy on a serum protein electrophoresis should uh, be referred uh, to a hematologist because uh, the monoclonal gammopathy does indicate an underlying malignancy and we need to do an appropriate workup on those folks and determine what they need. So I think uh, we'll go ahead and close here. I want to thank all of our uh, expert hematologists here for joining. I want to thank all of the participants for joining today. Uh, the, your attendance has been recorded. The video will be available on YouTube. Uh, we really would appreciate and welcome any feedback you guys could give. And I want to uh, uh, tell everyone to have a great day, and, and thanks for your attendance today.